an arrest in a nearly four decade old cold case. Thanks to cutting edge DNA technology, the arrest happening exactly 39 years to the day after 18 year old Michelle Martinko was killed in a parking lot at a mall. The suspect is now expected in court today. It was December 19th, 1979, an ordinary day. Michelle Martinko walked into a mall for a coat. But as she walked back into her car, someone snuck up on her. He opened the door and climbed in. She was stabbed to death. The scene hints that her attacker had something personal. Years passed with no suspect in sight until the shadow emerged from nowhere. Michelle Martinko's killer was in the full glare of everyone. He had moved on with his life. The truth shattered the city. Hello and welcome to Sasha's Reason and Crime. Who murdered Michelle Martinko and why? Who is Michelle Martinko? She was impossible to miss. She had the big blonde hair. She was that striking. She was striking. Just a smart, kind, nice person. Michelle Marie Martinko was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on October 6th, 1961. She was the younger of two daughters born to Albert and Janet Martinko. She attended Cedar Rapids Kennedy High School, where she was an intelligent student. School officials recognized her for her academic prowess. The teenager was also a talented performer and joined the twirling squad as a sophomore. She also performed in theater productions and choirs. Michelle was an all-rounder. In addition to her talents, she was stylish and beautiful. As a result, she didn't have many female friends. Most of the girls around her harbored envy toward her. To make matters worse, she stole the guy's hearts in her school. Unfortunately, her plans to attend Iowa State University to study interior design were cut short. An enemy vowed never to allow that to happen. The night of the murder. We can close this case. A stunning arrest. 39 years after 18-year-old Michelle Martinko was found brutally stabbed to death inside her Buick in an Iowa mall parking lot. She had gone to the mall after a choir banquet to buy a coat. It was December 19th, 1979, a cool Wednesday evening. Michelle Martinko visited the Westdale Mall in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, United States. She had just rounded up her choir banquet. She told her mother, Janet Martinko, that she would pick up the coat she'd set aside on layaway as a Christmas gift. Michelle planned to pay it off and go home after the mall, but that never happened. Her parents panicked. They feared something may have gone wrong. Her father, Albert Martinko, phoned the police by 2 a.m. the following morning. He joined the officers to look for his missing daughter. Nearly every police officer in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was outside searching for Michelle. After about two hours of searching the area, Michelle's body was found in the front seat of her parents' Buick, which she parked near J.C. Penney at the mall. Michelle Martinko was stabbed and cut 29 times. Her attacker targeted her face and chest. Her parents were devastated. They called Janelle, Michelle's elder sister, to break the heart-shattering news. They confirmed that they had seen the bloody, torn, and broken body of their beautiful daughter. Her parents practically choked on their words. They could hardly speak. Michelle came after five miscarriages. She was a dream come true. Why did she leave so early? Police confirmed that Michelle went to the mall that night. A few visitors who knew her confirmed that she was there. She even had dinner with a friend in the food court before going to the store to collect the coat. Michelle had $186 in cash for the coat. Unfortunately, she didn't buy it because she changed her mind. It probably didn't meet her expectations, but then she purchased a few other items. Her vehicle was parked a distance from the mall's entrance, meaning she had to walk alone in the dark for a few seconds. Earlier that night, she told someone she was nervous and felt somebody was watching her. She was last seen alive around 9 p.m. Police believed she got into a car and someone followed closely behind. When she got in, she turned the car on herself, warming it up to get the frost off the windows. At that moment, the stranger popped the door open, pushed her over, and climbed in. 
And no, it was nothing like a robbery scene. Michelle had money with her, along with items she purchased from the mall. They were intact. The autopsy report was out days later. It showed that Michelle died from stab injuries. The pathologist confirmed that she suffered a fatal stab wound in her heart. As a result, she bled to death. She was not sexually assaulted. However, she fought so hard with her attacker, it was unclear if he tried to assault her. At this point, investigators were confused. They tried to ascertain if the killer was an acquaintance or a stranger. One thing was sure, the killer wore gloves because the police found rubber glove impressions outside the car. No fingerprints were found, making the murder more mysterious. Although the police retrieved blood scraping from the gear shift and blood spots on her dress, DNA in 1979 wasn't as advanced as it is now. Although multiple people saw Michelle that night, no one saw a stranger approach her. The killer had vanished. The police would eventually launch decades-long investigations into the case. Investigations into the Michelle Martinko murder. One of the first people the police summoned was Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel. Michelle met him when she was 15 at a roller skating rink. He was a year older. The couple dated for two years, after which Michelle ended the relationship. Her friends told the police that Andy didn't take the breakup well. He grew angry and desperate. He was curious to know her every move, including who she was dating. That fateful night, Andy met Michelle at the mall. However, he left her there and went home afterward. His mother confirmed that he was home that night. He returned minutes before the mall closed. Andy told the police he was on good terms with his ex-girlfriend, even though they had grown apart. Andy was a key suspect, and investigators did their best to find evidence against him. Sadly, there was none. Andy left Cedar Rapids after high school and joined the Navy. Even so, many believed he was responsible for Michelle's murder. His DNA was eventually tested, and he was cleared. Five months after the murder, an anonymous woman stepped forward with a confession. She recounted that she saw two cars while driving past the mall's parking lot. One of them belonged to Martinko. A man was standing next to the driver's side of the vehicle. The murder happened between 10 p.m. and midnight, but this woman drove by at 2 a.m. She communicated this information to the daughter of the secretary of the Public Safety Commission. On June 19, 1980, police released a composite sketch of a man believed to be Michelle Martinko's killer. They described him as a white man in his late teens or early 20s. They said he was around six feet tall and weighed 165 to 175 pounds. He was believed to have curly brown hair and eyes. In the year after the killing, the police interviewed up to 30 people under hypnosis. A $10,000 reward was up for grabs for information leading the police to the killer. The investigator that cracked the Martinko murder. Matt Denlinger didn't think he would solve this cold murder case that haunted Cedar Rapids for 38 years. However, he believed the victim's family deserved to know what happened to Michelle Martinko. Matt was only five when Michelle Martinko was stabbed. As he got older, he heard so much about the case because his father, Harvey Denlinger, was a Cedar Rapids police detective. Harvey joined the department in 1970, and by 1979, he was promoted to investigator. He wasn't initially assigned the Martinko case, but he interviewed several Kennedy High School students. Whenever Matt's parents dropped him off at the mall, they would emphasize his safety and warn him not to go outside. The gruesome murder took a toll on the once peaceful city. Matt Denlinger had no plans of joining law enforcement. He wanted to become a special education teacher. Young Matt spent most of his time caring for his brother Jamie, who has special needs. He wanted to try something different after his student teaching program in Davenport. His father never talked him in or out of a law enforcement career, but Matt was suddenly attracted to it. He wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. It made sense. Coincidentally, Harvey Denlinger was 44 when Martinko was killed. Matt was the same age when he solved a murder puzzle and arrested the suspect. The task was the hardest in his life. Matt Denlinger officially took over the cold case in 2015 from Doug Larison. Larison had a master plan he swore by. He obtained DNA from possible suspects and compared them with clues from the crime scene. In this case, Martinko's black dress had blood on it. Investigators have since believed that the suspect cut himself while stabbing Martinko. They 
knew this because she had many defensive wounds on her hands and arms. By this time, DNA technology had reached an advanced stage. Matt Denlinger was hopeful that he would use it to find the killer. He started by reviewing hundreds of boxes of information and reports on the case. The first few days were overwhelming. What more can one expect from a case spanning over three decades? Matt talked to Larison and then to J.D. Smith, the retired investigator. After listening to their stories and experiences, his interest heightened. Matt read every report about the case. That is a whopping 7,800 pages. It seemed like a lot, but this paved the way to identifying the suspect. After eight months of working on Michelle Martinko's case, Denlinger grew impatient. He needed a new plan to narrow down suspects. He was tired of swabbing random people for DNA samples. He knew that sticking to the old routine would drag the case further. Something happened in 2015. That year, Denlinger bought his wife Nicole a DNA kit from Ancestry to explore her family roots. After the test, he looked at different areas on the map showing where her ancestors lived. Nicole was curious, so she asked, what if you could do this with your case? Ironically, Matt had not thought of that. He immediately called officials at Ancestry to see if he could upload the suspect's DNA profile to their system. They declined since it was not part of their services. Matt Denlinger was more determined than ever. He figured he could contact a private lab. Fortunately, he reached out to Parabon Nanolabs, a Virginia company that helps law enforcement use DNA to predict what a suspect might look like. Of course, this technology could help him predict new leads, but then it was expensive. The procedure cost $5,000. Matt had to make a presentation to his supervisors to sell the idea to them. He sounded desperate. They were already behind the clock and needed to act fast. It was 2016, and the chances are that the suspect was closer to death, if not dead. Although Martinko's parents were dead, Janelle Stonebreaker, her sister, deserved answers. After his supervisors graciously approved the funds, Matt embarked on the mission to find Martinko's killer. The images from the DNA profile were released to the public, and the police received hundreds of leads and tips. They collected over 125 DNA samples yet none led to the murder suspect. Matt was not discouraged. In 2018, he kept thinking about his wife's ancestry results. He wondered if building a family tree could help crack the murder case. At the time, the Golden State Killer had been arrested thanks to genetic genealogy. Again, he approached Parabon Nanolabs to explain his latest idea. The lab agreed to upload the suspect's DNA to GED Match, a public database they believed it would help find the suspect's family trees. Days later, the lab reached out to Matt with good news. They traced the suspects to four family trees of great-grandparents. But there was one more task ahead. Investigators were tasked with finding living relatives, collecting their DNA samples, and identifying one whose DNA matched the suspects. It was a tedious task, but they were hopeful. He and Smith used resources like newspaper clippings, gravestones, county records, birth and marriage announcements to find possible relatives on the family trees. Two branches were empty, but they found a hit on the third. They found Brandy Jennings from Vancouver, a distant cousin. She was a single mom and an office manager. She led investigators to Janice Burns, whom investigators believed was the suspect's first cousin. In the fall of 2018, Denlinger interviewed Janice Burns. She was accommodating and provided him with a DNA sample and a family tree. Parabon Labs took it and narrowed it down to one of three brothers who grew up in Manchester, Iowa. The police department later collected covert DNA from a subject. The collected DNA was a match. Although this was a significant milestone worth celebrating, they didn't go public with this revelation just yet. However, they called the Stonebreakers and broke the news to them. They wanted to be cautious so they didn't give any names. Denlinger told his father he had found the suspect and that he was still alive. Harvey was excited about the development. Denlinger and two other officers started collecting DNA samples from the three brothers. First was a drinking straw from one, a toothbrush from another, and a drinking straw from Jerry Burns. It took them about two weeks to gather the evidence. Denlinger watched Jerry Burns sip several sodas on October 29, 2018 at the Pizza Ranch in Manchester. Sitting close to him was surreal. 
he knew there was a 33% chance that the man he looked at could be the suspect. He was optimistic, but there still was more work to do. He and Smith had to conduct background checks on the brothers. The result was even more frustrating. After checking the brothers, they found no connections to Martinko or Westdale Mall. They exhausted everything, looked at vehicle tags, cars, and jobs. Up next was the interview stage. The session left an unanswered question. While other investigators interviewed Burns' two brothers, Denlinger and Smith headed to Jerry Burns' office for an interview. Investigators were convinced that the other brothers knew nothing about the murder, but it was not the same for Jerry. Denlinger had a secret camera planted on his coffee cup when he and Smith went to talk to Jerry Burns. Jerry agreed to speak with him. He was calm. When investigators told him they found his DNA at the crime scene, his behavior was odd. The suspect was emotionless. When they asked if he murdered someone, Jerry's response was, test it. During the interrogation, Burns tried to change the subject. He talked about his cousin who went missing in 2013. He then brought up Jody Heisentreit's case, an incident that hadn't been discussed earlier. Jody, a renowned news anchor, was abducted near her car in the parking lot in 1995. She worked in Mason City, Iowa, two hours from where Burns lived. She was never found. Jerry Burns admitted that he remembered the Martinko murder case, but didn't know much about it. After 40 years, the suspect was finding the right words. He didn't have an answer to most of the questions. Maybe he rehearsed his statement, but the presence of the police caught him off guard. Burns was arrested after the interview. The police read his Miranda rights and drove him to the station. Jerry Burns' trial and sentencing. Jerry Burns owned a powder coating company and previously owned a truck stop. He had been married, but his wife died in 2008. The 66-year-old denied any role in Martinko's death. He went to trial in 2020 and was charged with first-degree murder. The jury heard two weeks of testimony and deliberated less than three hours before their verdict. The Scott County Courthouse declared him guilty. The courthouse broke down in tears and a sigh of relief from Martinko's family. Her sister, Janelle Stonebreaker, was in the front row with her husband when the verdict was announced. Her parents didn't get to see this day come, and her sister is still alive and well. It's still great, you know, to finally hear those words that we've been wanting to say for so long. You know, they caught him. Burns was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This verdict did not sit well with his attorneys. They raised several issues in the case. They argue that collecting Burns' DNA from his straw violated his Fourth Amendment rights. Several other civil liberty groups, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the American Civil Liberties Union, supported Burns' appeal. Meanwhile, John Stonebreaker reacted to the verdict. He said, this court, as an instrument of the law, will soon punish Mr. Burns for taking Michelle's life. But the law cannot punish him for the damage done to her family and loved ones. The law cannot punish him for the terrible shock, shame, pain, and devastation in the innocent lives of the killer's own family and his loved ones. Burns maintained his innocence through his attorney, Leon Spies. In an August request for a new trial, Spies said that the newly discovered evidence cast doubts on his client's conviction. As a result, he wants a new trial. Part of this new evidence claimed that Martinko had an organ lesson at Westdale Mall Someone may have been watching and waiting for her in her car. Spies argued that her killer was someone who knew she would be at the mall for the music lesson. Burns said he did not know Martinko and couldn't have heard her. Spies believed that if the court hears the new evidence, the guilty verdict would be different. Martinko's family responded to those claims. They said she was not enrolled in any music lessons at the time. Her friends and family did not mention it during the investigation. District Judge Faye Hoover Grindy declared that justice was not miscarried and the evidence supports the jury's verdict. He struck out Burns' motion for a new trial. In all, Janelle hailed her sister for helping crack the case. By fighting for her life, she caused the suspect to cut himself and leave his DNA behind. Tell us in the comments below if you think Jerry Burns deserves a second trial. Is his verdict a done deal? Hit the like and subscribe button for more mind-bending crime stories. See you in the next one. Video Description 
Michelle Martinko's death shattered the peace of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Years after the murder, Michelle Martinko's case went cold. Luckily, Matt Denlinger searched through the files and hit a major milestone. He found Michelle Martinko's killer. The suspect, Jerry Burns, was sentenced to life imprisonment. This video is a full documentary on Michelle Martinko.